Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. We read in the scripture that God is a God of love, and that's true. God loves righteousness, holiness, those things that are in line with his character. But because God loves those things, when we live in disobedience to the character of God, all of those attributes God hates. And the Bible speaks very clearly that God does not like rebelliousness. He equates rebelliousness with witchcraft. So we need to ask ourselves, are we people who are submissive, who are obedient, who strive to live in a righteous manner reflecting the glory of God, His truth? Well, when we do, we're going to find blessings. But when we don't, we're going to find God moving against us. And that is exactly what we see in this week's study. Take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Daniel and Daniel chapter 4. Now, we spent the last two weeks in how God gave a powerful message to King Nebuchadnezzar. And I'm speaking about this event with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because they were faithful to the God of Israel because they would not bow the knee to idolatry. What happened to them? Well, as we talked about, they were cast into that burning furnace of fire, one that was heated up so hot, but nevertheless, God delivered them. And it speaks about a God who is all-powerful, a God who is indeed a Savior. And we find that Nebuchadnezzar, he was looking into the furnace, he saw that that fire so hot did not harm these men. And behold, there was a fourth one in there with them, one like the Son of Man. And we're speaking here about Yeshua, the Messiah. And what's so important to see here is that God gave to Nebuchadnezzar, he gave to him revelation. I mean, when we look at the end of chapter 3, what we find is that Nebuchadnezzar, he realized that it was the God of Israel, the God of these three faithful men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that this was the God who was the one true God, and he is worthy of worship. And it's with that statement that we need to remember that chapter 4 opens up. So as I said, Look with me to chapter 4. Now, in the biblical text, in the Aramaic language, we find that that chapter 3 is continuing for a few verses, and then chapter 4, but in the English, we find it's chapter 4. So, let's begin. Notice what it says here. And King Nebuchadnezzar, to all the people, nations, and languages who dwell in all the earth, So the message, this revelation that God gave to Nebuchadnezzar, he received it, and he's doing a great thing. He is sharing it with all of those in the earth that is all under his authority in his empire. He's doing a right thing. And once again, Nebuchadnezzar says, to all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, your peace be multiplied. Now, why that statement, at this time, your peace be multiplied? Well, the answer is very simple. Because when we walk in obedience to that truth, that God, the God of Israel, that He is the one true God, that He has a Son, Messiah Yeshua, who is a deliverer, who can take us out of great persecution, distress, hardship, whatever, even overcome death. Now, when we realize that and we submit to it, 
we can have an abundancy of peace. That is, in this context, that contentment, that joy, that, that satisfaction that God places within a person's life that's not depend upon anything earthly, fleshly, material, based upon this wonderful relationship that we can have with a personal God. So look on to the next verse. It was good in my eyes to tell the signs and the wonders which he has done with me. Who's done? Notice how he refers to God here. He says, the most high God. And this is a way of saying that God of Israel is supreme. He is the one that's over all things. This word speaks about authority. And this is something that we don't hear enough about. And that is that we should always approach God realizing that He is authority. Everything in our life must be subjected to Him. So once again, this Most High God, next verse, how great is His signs and how awesome or strong or powerful are His wonders. His kingdom is forever and his government is from generation to generation so there's this eternal quality of the kingdom of god and nebuchadnezzar he knew this it was revealed to him in a very personal way and as we read these opening verses what do we find nebuchadnezzar is right he has done a good thing but here's the key and this is foundational for understanding our study today. And it is simply, are we going to continue in the things that are true? When God reveals to us something and we understand it, He's given us information, are we going to walk in the truth of that information or are we going to fall away, slide back into the former things of our life? Those things that should have been passed away, never long, never again dealt with. Well, notice what happens. Verse 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, I was tranquil or at rest in my house, and I was being refreshed. And this word refresh is an important one. It can oftentimes have spiritual ramifications. And I want to emphasize that because this next word in the text, most English Bibles translate it as a palace. But we see something. He was at his home resting. And then this next word has to do with being refreshed. And as I said, spiritual overtones. And the word here is not so much a palace, but rather we find that it has religious or spiritual overtones as well. It can be a word for sanctuary. So what we find here is that Nebuchadnezzar, in spite of the fact that God revealed to him who he was, Nebuchadnezzar is back in a pagan sanctuary. And notice what happens. Look now to, to verse 5. I saw a dream, and this dream frightened him very much. It says, I saw a dream, and I was frightened. And then it goes on, and it speaks about him thinking. And the word here means to think over and over and over in your mind. So this dream caught his attention in a very significant manner. So he was thinking and thinking concerning the visions that he had on his bed, in his head, and once again, he was troubled by them. They troubled him. Verse 3. Then I commanded, literally, verse 6 in this text, then I commanded that should be brought before me all the wise men of Babylon. Now, here's the problem. Because Nebuchadnezzar, he knows Daniel. And what we find here is that Daniel, he's the one that should have been looked to. But he's going back to these so-called wise men of Babylon, not realizing that there's a God of Israel and there is people from Israel, namely Judah, that has been brought there by him and he's not utilizing them. He doesn't understand 
that these individuals are there to be a blessing for him. So he does not understand God's order, his program for revelation and when we submit to that revelation, the outcome of it, which is blessing. So once more, verse, verse 6. Then I commanded that the sages of Babylon be brought before me in order that they should declare to me the interpretation of my dream. Now, we're going to see in the book of Daniel, there are many dreams. Nebuchadnezzar, we've already talked, he had a previous one. But in that previous one, he could not remember the dream. And remember, he called, as he did in this case as well, his leaders, those sages and people, enchanters and wizards and such, in order that they would reveal to him the dream and then give him the interpretation. And they could not. They said, you know, if you give us the dream, then we can give you the interpretation. But you can't expect us to give you the interpretation unless we first hear the dream. Well, Daniel was able to do that, and now we're going to see something else. One of the messages of this passage of Scripture is how insufficient, how inadequate, and how deceptive these individuals are. This is progressive revelation for us, the reader. And what we're finding is these individuals, these enchanters, wizards, magicians, all of how you want to translate these so-called wise men of Babylon. Remember what they said. If you give us the dream, you tell us what it was, we'll give you the interpretation. Well, here they can, can receive the dream. He'll tell them he remembers, that is King Nebuchadnezzar, but they are not able to give him the interpretation. So what they said earlier was not accurate. So they are literally what the scripture is revealing to us is that they are men of deception. Verse, verse 7. Then came the Hartumim, very important word, referring to these sages, these wise men, and also the wizards and the Chaldeans and the magicians. And I told to them the dream, but they were not able to inform me of its interpretation, as I said, verse, verse 8. Then we find that at last Daniel entered in unto me, whose name was Balshazar. Now, his name is a pagan name, as we're going to see according to, what does it say here? According to my God. And here's the problem. One of the hopes of mine in providing these lessons is that not only do you listen to what I'm sharing with you, but you learn the proper methodology for understanding the scripture. And when we look here, there are clues. In fact, in every biblical passage, there are clues, things that God wants us to pick up on that assist us. They are aids in helping us understand what's going on in the text so that we arrive at the proper understanding. And why do we want to arrive at the proper understanding? So we can apply it to our life and demonstrate the truth of Scripture. That is why God has saved you. That is why you are still in this world, so that you can demonstrate the truth of Scripture in your life. And if that's not a concern of yours, you're not serious about God. If you're not walking with that objective, that desire, if you're not passionate about these things, then you are really not a servant of God. So Nebuchadnezzar says, I'm going to give Daniel, I'm going to change his name. And what this name means, Balshazar, what it means is that Baal, and this was his God that we mention here, is a defender or a protector. Here's the problem. Nebuchadnezzar is under the false impression that Baal, that is his God, a false God, provided Daniel for Nebuchadnezzar's well-being. And that's what that name reveals. Well, this is a falsehood. Keep reading. Speaking about Daniel, it says, a man who is, has the spirit Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God in him. Now, it literally says the spirit of a holy God. I realize that most English translations, 
they will put it in the plural, that he has in him the spirit of the holy gods. This is, in my opinion, an heir. Now, it is in the plural, but you need to realize something. The word Elohim in Hebrew is plural. There are many times words in Hebrew and in Aramaic that are plural but have a singular, a singular understanding. And this is the case. So what's being revealed to us is that in Daniel is the spirit of the holy God, not holy gods. We need to understand it rightly because there's only one God. So in Daniel is the spirit of the holy God. And I will tell to him my dream. Verse, verse here, 9. And Belshazzar, he was the, the leader of the sages. He was the master over them, you might say. And I made known to him what it says, because he knows that the spirit of the holy God is in you. So Nebuchadnezzar is speaking. He says, I know that the spirit of the holy God is in you and all things that are, are stoom, that is all things that are hidden, he says, are not difficult for you. This is the vision of the dream that I saw. And say to me its interpretation. Verse, verse 10. So here, what we're going to see is Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And notice what happens. He says, verse 10, Upon my bed I saw visions of my head, and behold a tree in the midst of the earth. Now, the word here that's being used here has to do with the earth. And what we need to see is this. This message has global inter, uh, implications to it. What we're studying, especially in Daniel, it is going to reveal that when we're looking at a kingdom expectation, that is when we're expecting the kingdom, we're looking at the things of the last day. And by the way, we're in the, the first part of the book of Daniel. As we get towards the end of the book of Daniel, there's going to be an emphasis upon the achritayimim, the last days, the end times. And all that we're learning in this book of Daniel is to help us to know two things. The events, how to discern the events of the last days and un understand other prophecies so that we can have a right perspective for what's going to take place. And why is that so important? Well, the answer is so that we can live in obedience, that we can be found faithful. Remember one of the things that Messiah Yeshua said. And speaking about his return, he says, The Son of Man is coming, but when he comes, will he find faith upon the earth? And what you and I need to realize, and the purpose of this series in the book of Daniel, is to give us biblical truth so that we can be found faithful in the last days if we should be alive at that time and i believe that those last days are not that far away this book of daniel and our studies have great significance great relevance for us today as we see certain things happening throughout the world so look again at our text once more we find here in verse verse 10 in the middle of the verse, behold a tree in the midst of the earth, which was great in its height. Verse, verse 11, and it grew, this tree, it became strong and its height reached into the heavens. So now we're looking at a kingdom that has a spiritual ramification. There are spiritual implications because it reached all the way into the heavens. We're going to see that what we're speaking about has to do with an empire. And what we're learning about this empire and the leader of this empire, Nebuchadnezzar, is going to help us to understand things that will take place in the last days. We'll say more about that in the relevant time. So once more, this tree grew, it became strong, its heights reached into the heavens, and it appeared to the ends of the earth, meaning its rule, its administration, this empire covered the entire world. 
Now move on to, to verse, verse 12. The leaves were good and its fruit were abundant. And it came about in it was, was food or nourishment for all. And in its shade took, took refuge the beasts of the field and in its branches dwelt the birds of the heaven. And we find here that they found from it, all flesh found from it, nourishment. So it was a provider. It was exceedingly prosperous. It was what we could call materialistically successful. So in the last days, this empire, and here again, we need to understand a paradigm. What's the paradigm? Well, in the book of Revelation chapter 17, we studied this uh, more than a year ago, we talked about how John saw a vision of an empire, a beast with seven heads. And these heads, well, they were Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, the Medes and the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, and then there was a seventh one who we anticipated would be the end. But there was additional revelation and there was a surprise that there was also an eighth. So these are important empires. And it says here concerning the eighth, the eight is of the seven. Now, in one sense, we can understand that, that that final one is going to be a resurrected seventh one. But there's a connection between the seventh and the eighth with all the others. So as we learn about these empires that we're doing so in our study of the book of Daniel, realize we are being given bits and pieces of wisdom, of information for our right understanding of the last days. So this empire, strong, powerful, expansive, it gives nourishment, it is a provider for all the world. Now, verse 13. And I was looking in the visions of my head while I was upon my bed, and behold, there was a watcher, and this is a, another name for an angel, and a holy one. And he came down from the heavens, verse 14. And he cried out with a loud voice, and thus he said, cut down the tree and we find here uh, uh, trim the branches and shake off its leaves and scatter its fruit so there's going to be a judgment and notice what it says that there was a watcher and this is an important term now all the scholars agree that we're talking about an angel and here again an angel doesn't necessarily mean a, a created being like we think with the wings and the halos and such, that, that popular uh, view of what an angel is. But the word malak in Hebrew is simply one sent. So in one sense, we know in another passage of Scripture from the book of Genesis, Messiah, who was not created, who is eternal, there was never a time he did not exist, He's also called a Malak, one who is a messenger, one who has been sent. The other thing here is we find the word holy. And it's important that we understand this, this word holy. We've mentioned before. It has to do with purpose. So this one was watching. And he saw something. And he responded to that coming down from heaven and in regard to the purposes of God. And notice what he did. He brought judgment upon this empire. To the extent, look at the end of, of verse 14, we find that the beasts fled from below it and also the birds from its branches. Verse 15. But, and this is a very important part, but we find the stump of its roots in the earth, it remained. So this, this kingdom empire, Although it was cut down, there was the roots and the stump that remained. And not only did they remain, but notice they're going to be preserved. And this is important because it foreshadows a, a restoration, a type of reappearing. What I said earlier, resurrected, this empire is going to come back. 
and we read, look at the middle of verse 15, that it was fastened with iron and with bronze in the, the grass of the field. And from the dew of the heavens, it will be watered, it will become wet, and, and with the beasts, it will be its portion, and with grass, it says that upon the earth. So this tree, it is going to be preserved, and we find here, that is going to be rained on, and it's also going to uh, be treated like an animal rather than an individual. And we'll see why in a few minutes. Look now to verse 16. And the heart of this man, speaking about the ruler of this empire, changed, and in its place it was given the heart of a beast and it says for seven epochs of time, probably seven years, pass over it. And I think it's so important that we see those seven years passing over it. Why? Because those seven years, when we get to Daniel chapter 9, in a couple months, we're going to see why that number seven in the end times, the last days, are very important. Once more, we find in verse 17, and this was a decree by the watchmen, and it was determined, this thing was determined by the words of the holy ones, that this thing should be on account that all life should know that the Most High God, He rules in the kingdoms of men, and He's able to give it to whomever He desires, and He's able to humble men, then He's able to put the humble people uh, upon it so what do we learn here that God is in control the primary message of this prophecy as we've seen it thus far in the first half of Daniel chapter 4 is to reveal that God is sovereign now does that mean that everything that happens is is God he's the cause of everything absolutely not many times God allows things and then he brings judgment upon it because we do indeed have a degree of responsibility for our action so this sovereignty of god is going to be taught in a right way in this passage of scripture well we're going to conclude with that until next week when we carry on in this important fourth chapter of the book of daniel and understanding principles of the last days shalom from israel well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.